Good morning and welcome to Lakeshore St. Andrews live stream. Today is June 7th and here are some morning announcements. I want to give you an update about last Saturday's food drive and drop that we had at the church. It was an exciting morning. This was a, a partnership with our Glengarry Food Pantry that's just opened up in the last few months. And our contact is Bob Cameron. And he came out here along with a few others that are involved in making this happen, but they have asked us to partner with them. So that's what took place. We had many people drive up and drop off their donation. Over two vanfuls uh, filled with canned goods were given and we're so grateful. Plus along with the food, we had over $600 in cash and that money will be used for purchasing some non-perishable or some perishable items such as fruit or vegetables, etc. So we really want to say thank you to all of you at LSA who came out and you gave so generously and we're looking forward, just a heads up, to doing this again in the next few months. Thanks again. Good morning, LSA. I just wanted to draw your attention to something that's really been speaking to me lately, and it's the daily devotionals that are being put out by Audrey Bauman. I've been receiving them for a few months now, and only recently uh, I started opening them and reading them, and I was so surprised at the amazing content that is in there and how it's really, really connecting me with God. And you are probably already subscribed to them and receiving them, but if you're not, feel free to go onto our website or email Sharon at the office and we can get you signed up. Feel free to check it out. Thanks. Earlier this year, I walked the halls of my high school for the last time. I went to my last college lecture. I saw some of my classmates and teachers for, for the, the very, very last, last time. time. And I didn't even know it. I had so many expectations of what was to come. Senior breakfast. Prom. That feeling when you finish the last exam. Being the first person in my family. To get handed a college diploma. Walking across the stage. All eyes on me. Good luck hugs. And final waves goodbye. It's supposed to be my time. My time. My time. My time. A celebration of hard journeys and sweet victories. Proof that I didn't quit. But in a blink of an eye. Everything changed. And despite celebrations lost, victories not received, honors not given, I'm, I'm taking, taking something, something with me. And not something taught in class, but something taught in life. I can do all things. All things. All things. I can do all things through Christ. Who gives me strength. But it's not just about me. There's still some people I have to thank. Because no one crosses the finish line alone. I want to thank my parents for believing in me no matter what and reminding me every day that I can do anything I set my mind to. For praying for me every day and pushing me. I want to thank my coach for convincing me that I can do anything. I want to thank my professors for helping prepare me for God's plan for my life. It's for helping me stay confident. You helped me stand strong even when I didn't think I could. I want to thank my choir and drama teachers for showing me how to use my talents in a way that honors God. I want to thank my parents for helping me fulfill my dreams and told me the truth, even when I didn't want to hear it. I want to thank all of my teachers for going above and beyond to help me succeed. Showed me how to embrace creative thinking. Hopeful living. I want to thank my small group leaders. You pointed me toward God. But I will stand in His strength. I'll step out with grace over grief. With courage over fear. I will love God. I will love others. And I will make my mark in this world. I'll make my mark in this world. And I will make my mark in this world. I, I, I am a graduate. If you have any questions, check out our website or our Facebook page, or give me a call at the office. I'm Sharon. Now let's continue with our morning service. Morning, everyone. Before we start this next song, I'm just going to pull up my YouVersion Bible app, turn to the book of Colossians, chapter 1, verses 15 through 17. It says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. 
He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else and holds together all creation. One of the key verses in that to me is that everything was created through him and for him. Everything brings him glory. Everything can reflect God in everyday life. And if you look hard enough, it's not too tough to see that. Um, one of the things that jumps out to me, even as some kind of silly as it was, was a kid's movie. And there was an example of a dad being really good to his kids. And around the same time as that, a friend of mine showed me this song for the first time. And to me, that was a new verse at the time. And it kind of like, oh, wow, it really does kind of come through anything. God's glory can shine anywhere and through anything. And that's always kind of stuck with me, that he can be a good, good father. The Bible tells us that among other things, we are his children. He is a good father to us. And it's one of the reasons I always love this song. I'm really excited to sing, and I hope you guys enjoy it and have are blessed by this. It's 
Bible is a love story of God to people, to all his people. And uh, it's a complicated book, but if you look at it from beginning to end, God's goodness, his love comes shining through. And uh, as we sing, God is so good, um, you can think about the ways big and small that God has been good in your life. separate your steadfast love who can escape your faithfulness an endless sea so full of grace and mercy we sing God is so Forgiveness flows from your veins. Your kindness shown in all your ways. And we sing, God is so good. God is so Well, good morning and welcome. Your planning team here at Lakeshore St. Andrews is very excited about 
what will happen during the month of June. We're launching a series called Identity Theft, and it is our conviction that it could have a profound impact on both your emotional and spiritual well-being. Over the next four weeks, I'll be joined by Shane Davis, Dave Francis, and Dr. Ben Kuo in leading this series as we seek to examine how we can we allow God to reshape any of those lesser players, places that we may have settled for in terms of defining our true identity. See, the problem is this. If you were to type the words identity theft into your computer or other device, you'd find a ream of material. But what it describes is not having stolen such things as your personal information. Things like social insurance number, driver's license, bank account data, and other such matter. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about your true identity. In fact, I'd like to call this message true identity. Don't settle for anything less. Dr. Terry Wardle, in his great book entitled Identity Matters, makes this bold yet profound statement, and I quote him. The ultimate mission of Christ was not payment for sin, or enabling us to reach a higher moral standard, or even an ability to spend our lives in service of his kingdom. Each of these treasures is priceless, but I assure they're not the reason for which Christ gave his life. Above all the riches that Christ brought to our lives, nothing surpasses the grace of securing our identity as children of God. Nothing surpasses the security of knowing our identity as children of God. So this morning I want to begin our journey by pulling on scripture in a variety of different locations to identify what it is God says about our true identity. In so doing, my intent is simply this. Discover your true identity and settle for nothing less. Allow me to take a moment to pray before we launch into that. Father, it would be our hope that you would meet us in this place and time and speak deeply into our lives as we would allow you to, not about the lesser things that we can sometimes place our identity in, but of place you want us to have, secure as children of God. So come and speak now, we ask. In the name of Christ, amen. I believe I can offer you two statements that highlight what makes this difficult, this journey so very difficult. The first is a statement you've heard me use a number of times, but is a, represents the most common place people often go to establish their sense of identity. That statement is, I'm not who I think I am. I'm not who you think I am. I am who I think you think I am. And simply put, it reflects the temptation all of us experience in life to clarify our identity based on what others think of us. The other statement comes from Tim Keller. I love what he says when he, and I quote, Christianity is the only identity that is received and not achieved. You might want to write that down. So I'm going to repeat it. Christianity is the only identity that is received and not achieved. So what we're going to do is we're going to take three questions to help us on this journey. And let's begin here. Where did we lose our way in pursuit of true identity? Where is it we lost our way in pursuit of true identity? I know of no better place to go with that question than to the third chapter of the book of Genesis. And for those of you who are familiar with this story, God set Adam and Eve up to enjoy a life of incredible beauty and bounty. But he offers one caveat. There's a tree in the middle of the garden, a tree of the knowledge of good and evil, from which they're not to eat. But you know the story. They succumbed to the temptation. 
And the consequences are significant, but perhaps none greater than their sense of a need to hide. And true of God, every time we go into hiding, he comes searching. So it plays out this way. And I quote from Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 to 10. When they heard the sound of God strolling in the garden in the evening breeze, the man and his wife hid in the trees of the garden, hid from God. God called to the man, where are you? He said, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid. Rather than allow God to embrace and heal their brokenness, they went into hiding. And to this day, not a lot has changed. When we take a hard look into who we really are and discover things we don't much like, we go into hiding because <coughs> if you knew who I really was, you might not want anything to do with me. Now, this may sound like a strange question at this point, but I want to ask it anyway. What do you remember being told about your birth? Because the stories of our birth are the place where our identity, or our own identity, first gets established. I have a friend. He's the fifth child born in his family, and his four older siblings never had a problem reminding him, you're the unwanted one. His parents struggling to make ends meet, really didn't plan on a fifth child. Can you even begin to imagine the damage done to one's sense of self with that kind of repetitive reminder? I've always had this kind of ruddy complexion. And apparently it's been that way since my earliest days. The only birth story I ever remember being told in my family was an expression that my brother offered when my parents brought me home from the hospital. It was this. He looks like a fried tomato. Can you take him back? Well, I don't know if anything I've used in those two examples has triggered a reminder of what you were told about your birth story. So I just want to take an aside here for a moment and say to parents, as often as possible, Tell your kids that they are not only loved and special to you, but beyond all of that, they are a unique and cherished child of God. So that's a little bit, I think, about how we lost our way in this journey towards true identity. And it leads to a second question. What is it that continues to keep us from being deeply rooted in our true identity? What is it that keeps us from being deeply rooted in our true identity? And to help us with that question, I'm going to call on the Apostle Paul and his wise words of advice found in the opening verses of Romans chapter 12. This is what he says. With eyes wide open to the mercies of God, I beg you, my brothers, as an act of intelligent worship, to give him your bodies as a living sacrifice, consecrated to him and acceptable by him. Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold, but let God remold your minds from within so you may prove in practice that the plan of God for you is good, meets all his demands, and moves towards the goal of true maturity. Did you take particular note of these words? Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold. And out of it, ask this question. When it comes to true identity, what is it that the world offers? A couple of weeks ago, I was in a conversation that was hard because it was with a young woman who was struggling with some of the painful issues in her past. It soon became obvious that some of her earliest memories arise out of being told that no matter what she did or how she did it, it would never be good enough. And that quickly morphed from not just only what you do into a rooted conviction that looks like this, 
I'm not good enough. I will never be good enough. The risk this world presents when Paul talks about don't let the world squeeze you into its mold, the risk that Paul presents, I believe, in this area of true identity centers on two things. The world says we find our true identity in relationships and accomplishments or achievements. Relationships and achievements. And when we allow either someone else, our own sense of achievement, accomplishment, to define who we are, we're moving toward allowing the world, as Paul says, to squeeze us into its own mold. So that's the question. Where do we lose our way in this search for true identity? And what is it that keeps, makes the journey difficult? But the real question in this, one of greater significance is this. Where do we go to get a clear fix on our true identity? You know, in the Bible, God uses the lives of a multitude of people in defining moments to help them understand what was their true identity. But none of those examples is as profound for me as the example that comes from the life of Christ. It's recorded in Mark's Gospel, chapter 1. And I read verses 9 through 11. At this time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. The moment he came out of the water, he saw the sky split and open and God's spirit looking like a dove coming down on him. Along with that spirit, a voice, now listen carefully, a voice that said, you are my son, Chosen and marked by my love, pride of my life. You are my son, chosen and marked by my love, pride of my life. I don't know if you can imagine how empowering it might be to have someone lay their hands on your shoulders, look straight into your eyes and declare, you are my son. You are my daughter, chosen and marked by my love, pride of my life pride of my life. But you see, it's not just anyone who longs to make that declaration over your life. It's God himself. And as the tears stream down your face, you come to the profound understanding as described by Tim Keller, your true identity is received and not achieved. So this morning, if you experience any sense that for too long now, you've allowed other things to, to define your true identity, I want you to take up a challenge. I want you to either write down or look up these words for yourself and print them on something that you can take a long look at as you begin each morning this coming week. And these are the words I want you to write. They come from 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. The words are these. What marvelous love the Father has extended to us. Just look at it. We're called children of God. What marvelous love the Father has extended to us. Just look at it. We're children of God. You see, this is the simple truth. The foundation of true identity must be this and only this. I am a child of God. So then as you head into each day, don't allow any other person or any other experience to define you. For as much as the statements of other or even your thoughts about yourself, about who you really are, they may hurt, but they're never a statement of your place in the heart of God. What others think or what you think about yourself are never to replace the statement that God would make that you are his child in his heart. So I'm looking forward to seeing you again on Wednesday. On Wednesday, I want to encourage you to bring a pen and paper because we'll walk through five questions that will measure how we're progressing in this life altering life-altering understanding of true identity. So let me pray with you this morning. Father, you meet us sometimes in the hardest places of our life. 
to take us to a better place. But before we get to the better place, you sometimes need us to walk through what has made life hard for us. And perhaps there is no more significant place than trying to establish not what this world offers, but what you offer in terms of true identity. So meet us as we work with this. Meet us on that journey and give us what you promised, the declaration that we are your children, loved and chosen by you, pride of your life. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. So as we wrap up the service this morning, we have a song for you. But before the song, I want to say this. We trust that you know that as you allow God to begin a good work in your life, his commitment is always to see it to completion point. So be confident of this, that he who is beginning a good work in your life will see it to completion. Amen. So oh.